Yeah, so it's done before they train. Essentially, a regular kids class is about an hour long, maybe an hour and a half on a day. They come in, we do some warm ups there. Then we spend literally a good 15 minutes on a topic to help it resonate for all the kids. Uh, we typically spend a week. Last week, we were talking about the types of crypto wallets and private and public keys. And so it starts with me, but the kids, they lead it themselves. Obviously, I, I teach them about what these are. And then we come in and say, hey, uh, Bryson, how would you explain to your friend here, right? Another kid who's 10 years old, 11 years old, nine years old. How would you explain to your friend the different type of crypto uh, wallet? Say, well, there's there's software wallets. And so we'll give them an example. What's the software wallet? And how would you explain to your friend or to your parent? Oh yeah, that's like your PayPal or like your Cash App on your phone. And you say, great, right? Because if you if you explain it to a kid or to a parent and you tell them, hey, get a crypto.com app or get you know Uphold or or you know a Binance, that makes no sense to them. They have no idea what that even means, mm -hmm. but they understand what a cash app is. They understand the Venmo, right? right. So, okay, great. Great example of a software wallet. We say, uh, talk about a paper wallet. What does that mean? And kids are like, yeah, just like it sounds. Like, <laughs> you would take it and use this paper and write your stuff on there. I think we're onto something really good here and how we can combine jujitsu and financial literacy for everyone. Because again, it's, it's about our whole school, but we really, really focus right. on, on teaching the kids financial literacy. If you want to see more videos and interviews like this from influential people in tech, finance, and sports, subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit the bell to be alerted. And go a step further and join the YouTube and membership area for early releases of videos like this. I'm out of here. Ha! It's your boy Crypto Blood, and welcome to another kicking it session. Today I got my man, woo <laughs> my man Ty from Crypto BJJ. I, listen. This guy sent me randomly on Instagram this video of him on the news teaching these little kids how to chop some throats, but also cop some crypto. Am I right? Nice, you got to nice. tell me about it. This caught my attention, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to welcome my guy Ty from AZ. You're in Arizona, huh? Yeah, I'm in Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona. What's the weather like out there right now? Bro, it's, it's hot there, but for us, it's actually like a like a cold front. But you know what I like about Arizona? Your heat is dry. It is. Your heat is dry. It yeah, is. it's dry. It I can do it. I was in AZ maybe about a year ago. I went down to see Max Kaiser. That's my okay. that's my good buddy. He did a tour, Bitcoin Rage tour, and he stopped in Phoenix. And I said I would come down and check him out. I ended up staying in Scottsdale, which I yeah. love. Yeah. But yeah, man. So tell us about what you're doing. Like you had a very unique way of teaching kids about crypto through you know i guess something that you're passionate about yourself already tell us about crypto bjj that is jujitsu kind of give us a little bit about that whole movement yeah so so really you know, we've been in business for for a few years now um had a little break during uh, during covid and um we always taught kids like character development, how they can be better citizens, how they can have good health, be responsible and uh, things like that. And then um, it, during the, the COVID time there, I really started getting deep involved in, into crypto and uh, started off with, uh, with the gentleman of crypto, which I still follow very, very well. And that led me to you. And so, uh, so then just started following your channels and like, man, this information is so amazing. Uh, how could we incorporate this into teaching children about financial literacy, um, you know, cryptocurrencies and how can, how can we help them? How can we do this? And so um, I spent probably the next year or so really learning myself more about crypto and, and blockchain and different kind of blockchains. What does that look like? What does it entail? Um, again, just doing that, that deep dive, the, the research, uh, what do you guys call the uh, pay intuition, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, right. So, so pay intuition through studying and learning uh, for myself. And then now how can you take this information and distill it down to where where a child can understand it, right? Because again, I, I think that's that's super critical because the children that, that we have today are growing up in this, this digital environment that might be a little different than the environment that you and I grew up in where, you know, maybe it wasn't so much digital and it started to change to where we are today. But today's kids are growing up in a completely digital environment there that's only gonna increase as, as they continue to, to grow. Right, so here's the video that he sent to me. He was, you know, featured on Fox, was it Fox 10? <laughs> Yes. Local news and the AZ. Yes. How did that whole thing come about? So, well, really, I teach a group of law enforcement officers, and uh, one of my law enforcement officers, uh, he actually works at the studio. And so uh, he was like, hey, what you're doing here with the kids is too important, it's too critical. Let me uh, pass on to one of the producers. 
so I talked to one of the producers at Fox and she was like, oh my God, like, like we have to do something like this is so amazing. Um, when's the next time you're doing a big event for the kids? So we do stuff like every day for the kids, but we're doing a week long, uh, literally a kid's crypto camp. And so, uh, so she was like, I'm going to send my reporters out over there. We're going to cover you. And so, uh, so they ended up doing like a, a full 20 minute segment. The reporters even stayed after they were done to, to even talk more with the kids and even mm. learn some jujitsu. It was really good. It was really good. That's dope, bro. That's dope. So tell us about yourself. Like, how did you get into the whole crypto space? What caught your attention? And give us that first experience in crypto. Yeah, I think, um, so I was actually in Japan and there was a, uh, interestingly enough, there was a Japanese guy who owned a, uh, a Jamaican restaurant, right? Mm. Was, uh, right? It's crazy. That's and so, <laughs> right. And so uh, he would have the, uh, uh, the big computers and like, and the screens and the mining things going on in the background in, in the shop. And so um, I would go there probably once a week or so, and I was always intrigued and interested. And maybe my fourth or fifth time there, I just I asked the guy, like, hey, what are these What are these computers? Like, what are you doing? And so that's when he first tried to give me an idea of, uh, of what Bitcoin is. Yeah, you know, I'm mining Bitcoin. And I'm like, like kind of, what is that? Like, like, what's going on? And so that's what actually first got me involved. He started talking to me about it. And then uh, because I had not done enough of my own my own research, I didn't really know like what that looked like. Then um, I didn't know how to buy it. And so, cause at the time I was in the traditional stock market. And so I was like, man, if I go through my traditional stock market aspects, like I can't, there's not a pathway for me to, to, to purchase crypto. Like, what do I do? And so um, that took some time for me to, to go and actually like, like figure out like, what does that look like? And I was doing some online research and that's what led me first to, um, to the general cryptos page. And so I um, started listening and like, oh my God, like this is amazing. Uh, how come more people don't know about this? And that's what first obviously led me to uh, basic exchanges like Uphold. Uh, mm, to the first, mm -hmm. like, like, okay, great. That was my first actual experience with, with crypto. Go through Uphold. And that's when I bought my first BTC. Was, so was that through Brave Browser, that connection, or no? Well, it was, yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so that was actually how I got into, into crypto. And then uh, and from there, just continuing to follow the channels like yours, the you know, crypto channel. I follow a few others. So I, so I, um, I listen to a bit more sometimes, not not a ton, but uh, I do like around the blockchain. Just I like to mm -hmm. get different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, and then just doing 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 the research, and then knowing now that it, this is too important of a movement and a shift in time globally to yeah. to keep this like just to myself or just to uh, to adults from what, how I look at it, and like how can I share this with? I have a huge youth youth group uh, for my school. Um, so like how can I how can I share this with children? in a way that's meaningful and impactful that they can easily understand and that they will want to get involved with the one. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, getting a, a certain message to the youth, to the kids, is the most impactful, the most long-term results you'll be able to achieve if you get it in the hands of the kids because they have generations to manifest the teachings that you have given them and trained them. They've got years and years to take that out to society right versus right. An, an adult we're only going to be as far as we're going to be we're maybe what 40 years 50 years max more life where you got these kids can have another 60 70 80 years to really put what you taught them back into society and into their kids and so on and so forth so no i commend you on that approach and i really never thought about getting that low or that young of an age in teaching crypto how do you go about it are what's your response to these kids when you teach them about crypto give us an average response from that yeah one it's, it's amazing it's uh, i think that sometimes we underestimate how smart kids are when you can break things down in, in a simple uh, I guess easy to understand term for them, right? Even even more simple than you might uh, explain something to like your grandmother or your grandfather. So for for us, uh, it would be something like the recent the recent uh, conversation where we had there. And the kids went and actually uh, posted a uh, a TikTok actually on inflation, and for us, say, what's an easy way to help the kids understand uh, inflation? So we have a kids crypto camp. Uh, we go down to the Dollar Tree and we buy. Um, some clipboards so the clipboards gets purchased uh, the clipboards at the time are all a dollar and then what happens by the end of the kids crypto camp those same clipboards cost a dollar 25 and, and he asked the kids like hey like like how is that how does it how is that possible like, like what happened here 
and the kids are they're trying to figure out like, like what's taking place and we say uh, uh, well no kids this is exactly how, how inflation works right where you have your same dollar bill that looks exactly the same that it did last week you know smell the same you think it spins the same until you walk back into the dollar tree and the same exact dollar that you were able to buy the same clipboard with you know one week ago two weeks ago you can't even purchase a full clipboard anymore like, like why why is that like what, what happened and and the kids can see that and they say oh my god this is this is this is interesting like what can we do about it um another example that we use for for the kids is talking to them about about banks and good or bad is, is a separate conversation but, but mainly you, you go to the kids and one example that we use is i would say hey hey john um you have 20 dollars right now that you're afraid to lose and because you're afraid to lose those 20 dollars, you're going to give it to me to hold for you so i'm going to hold your 20 dollars, john but check this out greg over here greg wants to go buy a bicycle and the bicycle that, that he's going to buy costs 20 dollars. i'm going to give him your 20 dollars, but i'm going to charge greg five dollars interest uh in exchange for lending him this money and so greg goes he buys the bike gives me back 25 dollars, and then you say hey john so now how much money do you have and john says i have 25 dollars. i said no 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 john you don't no, you, you have 20 dollars." i said no no I, I have more than that because i gave you gave uh, i gave you 20 dollars and you you lend it out there the other guy gave you five dollars back i said i know no it's crazy right but that, that five dollar uh, belongs to me and the kids say no that, that, that doesn't make sense i said no kids it doesn't make sense and who does this today and the kids say i don't know who does this you see the banks do it right and the kid this is the kids talking this is not even me the kids talking they say wait a minute no you got to call the military you got to call the police that's illegal you can't you can't do that i say i know kids but that's what the banks do to you today and they add, they don't ask for permission they take your money they lend it out uh without asking right and then they give you either no money back or they give you uh, some sort of an interest factor that doesn't even come close to, to keeping pace with inflation so kids like we know you are literally losing money every day by keeping money in the bank and not just you kids you say you know who else is losing money they say no way who else say your parents every day your parents keep money in the bank especially like savings accounts they're getting poorer which means you can't get more games you can't get new shoes, whatever it is there. And so and that resonates with them. I'm like, oh my God. And the parents sitting to the outside, as much of the conversations are for kids, a lot of conversations we have are also for the parents. So the parents hear this information, they're like, oh my God, like what that actually makes a lot of sense. And then that sparks conversation. They want to learn more, they want to understand like what's what's happening here. All right. And and then you get the questions obviously uh, of the volatility with crypto, which is what's kind of a separate conversation. But the point of it is it starts the conversation and parents can look and say, wait a minute, this doesn't what you're saying makes sense and i never thought about it in these in these terms here and more importantly it's so amazing to the parents like how their kids get it they literally, they literally get it they, they, they understand and so um so yeah so that's how we kind of teach the kids there and uh, matter of fact we even had them build their own business plans uh crypto related you know how can they go through and take whatever they're passionate about who cares like whatever they're passionate about there let's take that information there and how can you go and uh, uh become profitable from that there and using um cryptocurrency as your medium of exchange nice now, how do you organize for those that may not know or haven't seen any of your clips and stuff how do you, what's a an average day like do you teach it while you're teaching jujitsu ju or is it a separate segment within the class that maybe like a breakout session and you do crypto and then you come back and do jujitsu kind of give us how that all works yeah so it's done before they train so essentially a regular kids class is uh, about an hour long, maybe an hour and a half to come on the day. And uh, so once they, they, they come in, we do some warm ups there. Then we spend literally a good 15 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, but about 15 minutes on, on a topic. So uh, to help it resonate for all the kids, uh, we typically spend a week. So uh, last week we were talking about the types of crypto wallets and uh, private and public keys. And so we'll sit down That's and amazing. really- the conversation starts with me, but the kids, they lead it themselves. So obviously I, I teach them about what these are. And then we come in and say, hey, uh, Bryson, how would you explain to your friend here, right? Another kid who's 10 years old, 11 years old, nine years old. How would you explain to your friend what the different types of crypto uh, uh, wallets? And we say, well, there's there's software wallets. And so we'll give them an example. What's the software wallet? And how would you explain to your friend or to your parent? Oh, yeah, that's like your PayPal or like your cash app on your phone. They say great, right? Because if you if you explain it to a kid or to a parent, and you tell them, hey, uh, you know, get a crypto.com app or get uh, you know uphold or or you know a Binance, that makes no sense to them. They have no idea what that even means. Mm -hmm. But but they understand what uh, what a cash app is. They understand the Venmo, right? right. So okay, great, great example of a software wallet. 
They say, uh, talk about a paper wallet. What does that mean? And kids are like, yeah, just like it sounds. Like, <laughs> you would take it and there's a piece of paper and write your stuff on there. They say, uh, what's the most secure? Paper wallet's the most secure, but it's the least practical. It doesn't make sense, right? Because if you lose, the kids will tell you, my mom always washes my clothes and I leave paper inside of there. And if I have um, a paper wallet and all my keys are on there, then I lose my stuff forever. So although it's super safe and no one can get it, but it's super easy to, to lose and destroy. Mm -hmm. and, and they understand. And so, um, so yeah, so so we go and we spend, like I said, about 15 minutes or so. And then that topic will stay the same topic for the week. And and really by the end of the week there, you have the kids go and explain it to an adult who is relatively new, who may not have been there, you know, uh, during the week. So new adults coming into the class to get ready for their adult class. And you'll get the kids, hey, go explain that to, uh, uh, to this person over here. And they'll go and they'll sit the adult down and they'll explain to them uh, whatever the topic is for the week beautifully to where the adults are like, like, what is this? And like, I have to go and join in. I have to go get it, uh, a wallet today. Right. Wow. Are you planning on teaching the kids about things outside of crypto more so like, um, when you say crypto, I'm talking cryptocurrencies. Are you thinking about teaching them about NFTs and things yes. like that? So, yes. Yeah, so, so absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so when we say crypto, it's, uh, it's the, the full spectrum. Okay, so I look good. at it the same way as I look at like jujitsu. So I've been doing jujitsu for, for a very long time and uh, and there's you know more than you know a thousand moves in jujitsu. And I certainly have things that I like very well in jujitsu, but that doesn't mean that you might like those same things. So I believe my job is to teach you everything and let you pick what you like. Like you take it out of there, like, hey, this fits for my body type as it relates to jujitsu. So for the kids, there's a there's a huge space and it's specific to NFTs and gaming, right? That that from what I see for my kids, for my youth, uh, is that that's the world they live in. They, they live in a world where uh, where NFTs, even though they may not know the, the term, are very real in their space when they're playing Roblox or when they're playing Fortnite. Um, that, that's a very real world for them, right? When I ask the kids, and we, we have conversations about this, and, and kids today don't want physical dollars. They'd rather uh, their parents give them money to go buy more skins or buy whatever else they want to do within their gaming world. Right, because that, that's just that's the, the environment they live in, and so when you can take that and, and say, okay, great kids, this is fantastic. There's more than just the individual tokens, and now the, the tokens are, are, are the coins, depending on, on the conversation of that day. That's one aspect there to lead to projects, and then how can you delve deeper into individual projects for uh, something that you might like for yourself, right? And so if, you're, if it's a Gala Games kind of deal or, or something along those, those things, or Polygon, like a network that's doing big into gaming. What does that look like there to see that there's more again, like we talked uh, to crypto than just these tokens, right? Nice, nice. So uh, more about fighting styles and different techniques and stuff, <laughs> man. I, you know, I- You're a fighter, I mean, I know you're a fighter. Huh? I said you're a fighter. Yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes. No, but look though, I, I had a sensei that um, for many years I trained with him in his basement, ex-contractor, Used to go off, off do you know different operations or missions and jungles and all types of Rambo type shit, right? Right, right. right. And uh, he's got some battle scars for real. Like he's been in yeah. the trenches, but yeah. how he taught us was literally just straight application. We didn't go through all the formal, you know, one two step and you know how you would do in a traditional gym like maybe yours. We went straight to survival. I see you had like a tactical course as well, but we learned how to work with knives, defend against knives, and we just mixed like literally eight different styles into one training. Sure. From from uh, you ever heard of Fifty Two Blocks, Jailhouse Rock? Uh, I've not. Oh, okay, okay. Check it. Check out Jailhouse Rock. It's a style that was made and, and born out of the jail system. Being in in very close quarters, you had to learn how to fight in a certain way yeah i mean we did that i did a little jujitsu uh what is it called uh stadium <laughs> huh? yeah, like, yeah, like the bruce lee, the Jack, Jack bruce lee we did yeah, a little right, bit yeah, of that right. yeah yeah it was like eight different ones i don't remember we did boxing as well we had to learn how to box because yep. his whole philosophy is if you're going to defend yourself against a boxer you got to know how to box and how what a boxer would do sure so what styles have you learned over the years? Have you focused solely on jujitsu or do you know other styles of fighting as well? Uh, yeah, so so I do know uh, other, other styles of fighting. There. So uh, I'm actually a, a military vet. So Nice. 
So from jujitsu, I grew up my, my whole life doing several martial arts there. So several uh, different disciplines of, of karate. Uh, got into some Muay Thai. Yeah, Muay Thai. Uh, we did that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, some boxing. And so you take that to where, where I am today and you really incorporate that uh, all into one. So, uh, so at my school, uh, it's really like first and foremost there, it's about like how do you defend and uh, against, you know, real live people in the street there that are bigger heavier more athletic than you you know real street fights no rules no weight class like what does that look right, like first right right and then we start playing more into what does the the sport of jujitsu look like right where for the most part there are weight classes there are rules right which is very different than a street fight like when people right. watch the ufc today they see the ufc as a fight and say ah it, i mean it is but it's very artificial right again because they, there are weight classes there are all rules, all rules. Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day when you get a real street fight um it's different than 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 what takes place in the sport so there's a reason why mike tyson is not fighting floyd mayweather not that their skills are the same though but exactly. he's a bigger than him, right? exactly. <laughs> and if we just choose to throw punches bro like again it's not a guarantee but it, 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 i mean hey it's a hundred pounds <laughs> tyson <laughs> tyson's gonna knock floyd out bro <laughs> or, <laughs> slam him to the ground right <laughs> not even a punch it's just more <laughs> like just yeah. go at him. You're gonna crush him, right? Yeah. And so, so yeah. People have to first, from our perspective, they have to first and foremost like understand what that looks like. And uh, you mentioned like the law enforcement piece a little earlier, and that that's that's very relevant too, like in their world. So uh, it's very very important to me as a, as a minority too to, to go and say, uh, I see there's a problem, and and I can't complain, and I, and that's fine, right? But I, I also am in a position to do something about it. Right. And so, so how can I go and, and provide, I think, uh, law enforcement, right, an, an avenue to where they may not have to go and delve into their, their duty bill. Uh, right. First response. Right. Is there, exactly. is there a better way for them? Right. And so, um, again, as a minority, it's very important to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Because like, like, hey, like, like how, what do we do? Um, and, and the police, I believe, need that thing, too, because the, the reality is this, that most people, not the most, like, like beyond most, you know, more than 90% of people in the world uh, can't fight. They, they, they just think mm -hmm. they can't. They, you know, mm -hmm. guys more than girls, right? They think they're tough until they mm -hmm. run across someone who got to be tough. <laughs> like, oh, oh, damn, that's what tough is like. like. Yeah, I know, man. And so in law enforcement, no different, right? They're just because they have the bad job, it's like, oh, I'm tough until you run across some dude who's about that life. Right. right? And then, like, or hey, on drugs or high on something, right? Where right? pain won't affect them as, as easily. Right, it's the truth. But you don't want to take their, you still don't need to take their life. Right. Correct. There are ways you can subdue them, get them down in a tactical way. Yep. And I agree. That's a great approach that you're trying to implement down there in AZ for sure. Yep. I think one of the things that I learned just in the few years that I trained with my teacher is this situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you if you get yourself, if you become more aware of your situation and your surroundings, you can maybe leave like Literally. That's not always fighting. Is fighting is not always the answer. Right, right. Where is there an exit? How can you move out of this situation before you have to go to that point? I know, like in AZ here in Michigan, we can carry. Oh, yeah, we yeah, got, yeah. We got open that, carry. Yeah. We, you know, we can yeah. do that as well. We train with that as well. But how do do you incorporate that in any of your other than the law enforcement one? Do you incorporate yes. firearms with your trainings? Yeah, you have, yeah. So, so minus the the kids, uh, right? Yes, right. So because, uh, like in Michigan, right? So Arizona is a uh, open carry state. Yeah. Uh, where now you don't even need permits to carry concealed here, and mm -hmm. so like, so I go in there with a the premise that everybody has a gun. That's what I have to I have to assume everyone here has exactly. A gun. <laughs> Right. And that you should. I, I think yeah. it's a better situation if if criminals yeah. think that everybody in that joint got a gun, versus I'm gonna go in here and exploit everybody and, and do whatever I want. Nah, everybody's got a gun in Arizona, and so yeah. so I go in there with that that first and foremost there, and so and also with the, the premise that hey, you know even even for me, so with all the the, the, the skill sets that I have, if someone woke up woke up today with like murderous intentions and they stand at the door of my school and they just start shooting, well then we're all in trouble. Exactly. I, it is what it is exactly. If I can touch you, if I can touch you, it's game one. And, right. And God help you. It's, it's going to be a problem. Right. Right. But, but, but even then, it's still like, hey, who wants to even deal with that? Like, whatever mm. they want, give it to them. Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. Right. So you want clothes? You want shoes? You want money? Take it all. Like, take it. Right. You can't. You can't take me. And that's what we teach for the kids, for for the women, for the the, the men. Like, they can't have you. Right. If you got kids, they can't have your kids. So anything other than that, they can take it. 
Does it suck? Right. Yeah, it'll suck, man. But you can get stuff back. Right. right? You, you can get stuff back. You can't get your life back. Right. And so, uh, so again, uh, if it's a situation where again they 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 want you, well then it has to go down. One of us, one of us ain't going home, man. Right. Because right. just taking me is not an option. Exactly. Right? So I think that has to be the uh, the mindset, and that's what we do for um for the kids. Do Do you mind if I ask you a question there? Because the kids had a question that, that they uh, uh they wanted to make sure that I asked you. Oh, for sure, for sure. So uh, and this is one of the uh, uh, like twelve year old kids, but he had he had a really interesting uh, question. And so, and so my kids, uh, they, they've all gone through the Bitcoin white paper. I mean, they, they know what's up. They, they, they do. And so their question was like, hey, with the crypto that they watch on um, on YouTube, whether it's your channel or whether it's general crypto, whatever they're watching they're on, 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 on YouTube, they seem to, to, to get the impression that most people are like, hey, you know, you get Bitcoin and you hold it. And from the kid's perspective there, that's, that's not the purpose and that wasn't the intent from the white paper. And so their point to ask uh, to a guy like you who's been in the space who's very smart and that can certainly teach us all is is why is the, the narrative more not about um people hold your your bitcoin until one satoshi equals one dollar right mm. to actually go to go and meet that bitcoin white paper um kind of perspective of being a peer-to-peer -peer lending aspect right so instead of hold until whoever knows when because that's that's the impression that we get and the kids get today is that you just hold forever until whenever that you know stops like, like yeah, yeah I, i'm definitely not of that camp ty <laughs> i don't believe in because what happens is with that philosophy and it's nothing wrong people have that philosophy and they have that right to believe that i'm not saying that they're dumb or wrong i'm just telling you what my opinion is on it i don't think that you should think that about any asset that you hold because you need to have a game plan in general right hold mm -hmm to win like when are you going to stop holding right have an exit strategy in everything that you do in life right you have an exit strategy you have goals that you hit or you should have targets that you want to hit so just a, have a hodl mentality is to me shows me that people um maybe not all but some of those people that say hodl they actually don't know what to do so they just hold right they don't they, they're scared to do something so they do nothing so they just hold bitcoin since its white paper in my opinion has changed has evolved satoshi could not of course no one can write a white paper and know exactly what that technology will do in the wild it's it's yeah. no one knows right you'll only know until it's out there it's been battle tested market forces get its hands on it you you start to see the random hand of, of economics play into it so you you know there's no way he could have known that it would not stay a peer-to-peer -peer cash um but I, I i will say that uh you should not just hodl forever because this is still an, ex an experiment like many other things you know it could it could go bust in 10 years quantum computers or something could come along and and you know break the encryption now could we update the protocol yeah for sure but in the meantime when that event occurs hell you could have lost all your money before before we do a reset and start all over and say okay we got the, the quantum resistant version of bitcoin now guys we can all use this or whatever so hodl forever is not a good strategy in my opinion uh is bitcoin cash unfortunately in the hands that have primary control over its narrative no it is not it is more of a asset class like a precious metal right a digital f a version of gold or silver or something along those lines that's how i look at bitcoin not so much as a cash peer-to-peer -peer system simply because we haven't allowed it to, at the base layer, grow, expand, and uh, increase its bandwidth. We're still at that one megabyte per block. Right now you say, well, you got layer two, and there are scaling solutions like Lightning Network and so on and so forth. Sure, that is a possibility, but in my opinion, I think that Lightning Network actually adds more centralization and attack vectors on the base layer protocol but that's a debate that is going to be had for many many years to go forward i can't say that i'm correct 
neither can the person that says Lightning Network is the solution end all be all. You should be careful about and do your research about who is behind the Lightning Network. You know, you got Blockstream is behind that uh, and some other big conglomerates, you know. So just be and I'm always careful and suspicious of any companies behind any particular narrative. What is the what is the economic incentive for you is the question I always ask. For you to push us to go the route of a lightning network versus just scaling the base protocol increasing the block size to five megabytes that's 5x larger than what the bandwidth is today right so i don't know if you were around in bitcoin when we had a lot of activity on chain back in 17 18 just okay. read about it just read yeah i mean prices were insane as far as the network activity, uh, you know, the, the mining costs, the transactional costs, 90 bucks, wow. 70 bucks. Like yeah. Ethereum, like Ethereum today. Yeah, Ethereum today, but on Bitcoin. I'm saying on Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. Saying, yeah, yeah yes. So we were seeing wow. Bitcoin's activity hit its upper bound, and the result, the end result was literally $80 transactional fees. Good night. Yeah. I haven't even read about that. I haven't heard that too right now. That's crazy. So we're nowhere near that type of activity on Bitcoin anymore because it's more of a speculative asset class at this point. It's all off chain rehypothecation stuff going on with these exchanges, you know. So if you were to see the type of activity on chain activity that we had in 17 and 18, your yeah, your fees would be astronomical. Even with SegWit, that did improve. The SegWit upgrade, upgrade did improve, but we're nowhere near the type of capacity as far as on-chain transactions that we as we were uh, back a few years ago. And so that, to me, is still a con of concern and why we won't see at this point, can't speak for the future, we won't know or see Bitcoin be used as cash anytime soon. One last point. I know I'm long-winded with this. No, no, but one last point that your students should understand is that Bitcoin is a what's called deflationary asset. Yeah. Meaning, and you understand this, I'm sure you've taught them this, there's a fixed amount of tokens in circulation. By nature, that setup is not advantageous for a cash, for a medium of day-to-day ex -day exchange because you suffer from it's called low money velocity, right? If I think the price of my Bitcoins are going to be X, Y, Z higher in five days, 10 days, a month, a year, I have more economic incentive to hold off from spending my coins versus spending them on day-to-day -day things. Sure, of course. So you have lower money velocity with deflationary currencies. That doesn't normally work in a real world we're talking real application everyone using bitcoin as a day that doesn't doesn't work well for economic activity and expansion unfortunately you need a currency that is either neutral or inflationary you need a coin that has a very small amount of inflation every month or every year or whatever and it's funny we talk about meme coins but i remember when you know i was in bitcoin when uh, i was in the crypto space when dogecoin was created i was part of the uh, initial dogecoin community oh, wow. yes yes it was a meme coin but it something happened in uh i want to say 2016 i believe or 15 they changed the protocol parameters in dogecoin to be inflationary it used to be just like litecoin but just, I think, maybe double the amount of supply that Litecoin had. It was something trivial like that. Yeah. But they changed in 2015-16. They changed the protocol to be 5 million coins inflationary every year. 5 million coins created every year. That is a perfect coin for cash. Because you want to spend cash. Cash is a medium of exchange. You I, you offer jujitsu. Okay, I don't mind spending Dogecoin for that right now because I know 
inherently in the future you know I'll ha there will be another five million coins in circulation i don't have a problem spending this right i'll keep my bitcoin for some goal in mind in the future not just hodl it but whatever it is what whatever dollar amount that is but yeah that's what i look at as a, a good coin to be utilized and adopted by the by the masses as a form of cash this is why you're seeing yeah this is why you're seeing stable coins become so popular because it's attached to a inflationary cat cat you know u.s dollar is inflationary <laughs> we, print, we print more all the time so if i'm if i'm doing something of value and i want to transact or store that value in a in a short term way because cash is not an investment that's economics 101 cash is not an investment it never has been right that's why it's cash so yeah bitcoin is not in its current form and function not going to be used as cash but that's okay that's, that doesn't mean it's not a great hedge against inflation long term sure, sure. long and i have to put the operative word word is long term yeah because we see bitcoin is going down in a higher inflationary environment that's a whole nother <laughs> econ 102 <laughs> session <laughs> on, on on why that is the case because there are different forms of inflation yeah but yeah man that's what i would tell the kids i mean they'll be able to watch this better. back yeah they'll be able to watch yeah. this back uh and, and see my response but those are good questions man those are definitely good questions yeah i think um let me sure i got their things there and it's funny you brought up the, the those coin thing because uh, that's literally what the, the kids are talking about there and then they were talking about um uh she does another way to do something similar so we talk about um uh, all the time watching um what the the whales right so kind of watch what the whales are doing not so much listening and the kids they very much understand that that concept there and so uh, so one question i could not answer this is, uh within the past month uh what kid asked me is that um if we are supposed to, you know, hey, you know, you tell us, you tell us to watch what the what the whales are doing, and we watch that the whales are at least some ETH whales are buying a bunch of shit, right? Why should why should we not be doing the same thing? And like, bro, like that's a great question, man. Like, yeah, I got nothing. Like, like I, yeah, like like it, yeah, I got it, I got it. I yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, you okay? So the the typically how it works with larger purchasers of any in any in any market they usually have some inside knowledge some information that is not no readily known to the rest of the market yeah so for them to purchase big quantities of sheep or any other coin they're doing it for a reason now could it be an exchange sure it could be an exchange needing more sheep for you know their order books or it could be a well so the thing is that's not a bad way an indicator to follow um you know we used to call them on this decentralized kind of like form um called steam we used to call that you had whales and you had the minnows so we would follow the minnows would follow the whale and eat off of the whale minnows eat and survive off of whales and what they buy up and eat so not a bad strategy at all just know that when you hear or see them this is a great thing about crypto though because unlike traditional markets it's there's more obfuscation there's more behind the scenes there's less transparency so a whale in equities would be someone that goes and buys a hundred million dollars worth of GE stock. I'm just using some company. Well, they don't have to report that in real time. They file out a K1 report or form or whatever, and they submit it to the SEC. And then you'll get that information. I don't know if it's the next quarter or it's something like that, or right? So there's a huge delay and gap in knowledge. Thank the beautiful thing about crypto. If you buy, if you're gonna be about it. It's going to show on the blockchain. <laughs> it's got to show on right? the blockchain. Right. So that's a great, I think, strategy that the kids are picking up there. Follow the whales for sure. Yeah, they see it. And then they go because they'll hear other other 
channels and stuff there and say, oh, you know, you know, it's kind of a meme coin. And the kids, they, at least my kids, are, are very, very, very perceptive. And so they say, well, they they see they see those and they say, well, from what they are what they're tracking is they don't see the the, the build out, right? They say at least on something like Shiv, they can see that where the guys are lying are going to work for you is, is a separate conversation. But at least from the the optics, it's like hey, they're trying to build something. Right. And so, yeah, uh, but yeah. you got to understand, at least in the original Doge community, it was never about building anything. It was literally just about giving. Oh, like, literally, it was about giving. We gave Dogecoin to the Jamaican bobsled team and sponsored them at the Olympics in Sochi oh, nice. one, the, in 2014 15. We oh. gave money to a NASCAR racer back then in 14 15 and had the doge coin the dog you know the doge on the actual uh, race car so we helped sponsor him to the race so it was a bunch of community charitable just doing it out of the fun and love of our hearts there was nothing serious about it so now that doge has become a very expensive or, or high market cap coin the community i guess seems to feel like it's in their best interest or they have some responsibility now to make it more serious because there's so much money in it and I can understand that but yeah let the kids know it was never intended to be yeah, anything more than just a meme coin and, and just have fun with coin it was like faster it was it, you know it was slightly faster than Litecoin at the time Litecoin was the fastest coin most popular fastest coin at that point you had Bitcoin then Litecoin used Script versus SHA-256 that Bitcoin used. And then, you know, they basically took Litecoin and just duplicated it, changed the supply by 10x and changed some other parameters and made it a little bit faster than Litecoin. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking about Dogecoin. Yeah, I'm sure. So, um, yeah, it wasn't meant to be like some serious, serious thing, which yeah. is cool because cash is shouldn't be something serious like that it shouldn't have a white paper and and then we got this vision road map and we're gonna burn you know we're gonna do this and do that it's just a coin yeah use it as such you know it'll be five more million out next year right so don't hold on too tight to them <laughs> earn it and then burn it you know what i mean so yeah that's that's kind of my take on that man but it's been it's been a pleasure uh yeah, having you on for sure let the audience know where they can find you i do have your site up but you also are pretty active on instagram i have your instagram yeah. up here you guys definitely go check him out instagram and twitter is probably the best there our site's being revamped there since we've started this, this huge crypto movement there so uh so give our site of, uh, about two weeks or so and then our whole website will be all done and revamped there so definitely twitter instagram or, or tiktok are, are the best ways to find this right now for sure nice nice yeah go follow crypto jujitsu he's got like 22 followers let's get that up people let's get that let's get that cracking uh ty is doing a great thing out there in arizona uh, we need to support him and uh, spread the word. Are you planning on taking this on the show? Are you planning on franchising this at some point? Uh, I, I, mean, I would love to. I, I'd like to just see kind of, again, where, where things are going. I think we're, we're on to something really quick here and how we can combine jujitsu and financial literacy for uh, and for everyone. Because, again, it's, it's about our whole school. But we're really, really focused right. on, on teaching the kids financial literacy. And so, uh, so I, I would absolutely love to do that. And so, yeah, that would be great, man. Oh, so nice, good. nice. Well, la there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another kick in this session. Make sure you guys like, share, and subscribe, and click that bell to receive more videos like this. I'm out of here. Holla!